Good evening. I'm Cassidy Sutton, president of our student group, Sport Management Alliance. I'm honored to welcome you to the conversation presented by Richard A. Maxwell Sport Media Project. The Maxwell Project is an academic and professional collaboration between the BGSU Sport Management Program, School of HSMLS, and the School of Media and Communication. The project is named, at, named in honor of Dick Maxwell, Maxwell, retired senior director of NFL Broadcasting and a generous friend to our schools. Our guest tonight is BGSU alum Marcia Sainholtz, retired senior associate at athletics director at Washington State University and a member of BGSU's Athletic Hall of Fame. Ms. Sainholtz will be interviewed by BGS, BGSU's interim athletics director, Stacy Koziak, and this conversation celebrates 50 years of Title IX at BG. Before we begin, please help us recognize and thank the many people who have supported the Maxwell, Maxwell Project and other special guests in our audience tonight. Professor Ray Schneider, director of HMSLS. Go ahead and applaud for him. <laughs> Michelle Sweester, head librarian, Center for Archival Collections. <laughs> and also from the center, Allison Bradenberry, re reformatting specialist. <laughs> Jennifer Long, Moorhart University archivist. and representing the BGSU teachers and coaches for, from the pre-Title IX women's teams, Professor Janet Parks, and Professor Patricia Peterson. Finally, I take this opportunity to mention that after these introductory remarks, our room will turn into a television studio and the w WBGU production team will take charge of this event. It will take them a few minutes to set up for the conversation, so you will have opportunities to ask questions to our guests at the end of the interview, after which it will take a few minutes for post-production. Now, as WBGU sets up, please turn off your cell phones and all other electronic devices. If your phones are active, it, won't disturb, it will not only disturb our audience, it will interfere with television production. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, welcome to this conversation. Uh, I have to say I am extremely excited about being a part of this conversation. Uh, I myself am a product of sport. Um, I came through uh, college athletics, 92 through 96. So obviously the perspectives that Marsha and I have are gonna be a little bit different. Um, I came through basically <coughs> on her shoulders. So the experience that I had was because of the battles that she fought. So thank you for that. And um, I'm so excited to have this conversation. Well, I'm excited to be here. And those lights are really bright. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's always fun to come back to Bowling Green and reunite with Jana Parks and Pat Peterson and Naomi Lee and uh, Gary and Dan Meyer, you know, who came from Washington State. And we wish Dan was back at Washington State these days, but uh, Janet said, don't take him away. So, <laughs> not that I would have power to do that, but Dan, you're always welcome at Washington State. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, obviously, I graduated in 1964, only 30, what, 30 years before you? <laughs> I mean, it seems like yesterday, but it was a century ago. And uh, to see the changes, um, our gym is gone. <laughs> in the Epler building where I played basketball and now it's a design studio I guess or something like that so uh, it's always interesting to come back and reminisce but it's also exciting to come back and see the progress that has been made and how this university has grown and uh, met the challenges of the times and I got a great education here and uh, it's always had a special place in my heart so we, you know, the goal for this is to be a, a conversation. Yes, I have a lot of uh, prescribed questions that we're going to go through, but I do want to, as a disclaimer, I may veer um, because I do have a tendency to do that. So that is my disclaimer <laughs> for the evening. Um, and my disclaimer is I may not be able to answer that question. <laughs> 
I promise you, you will. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 So let's dive right in. Let's let's start at the beginning. Okay. So can you talk about your early sport experiences? So what did you play as a kid? What did you do growing up? Um, growing up, I played in the streets with the boys. I was the only girl in the neighborhood. And uh, I've been passionate about sports ever since I can remember when I was five years old, I guess. And uh, back then, we played baseball in the streets and football in the streets. And there wasn't a hoop in every uh, driveway. And we went to the park and um, you know, played hide and seek and kick the can and all those kinds of things. But we were always very active. And I collected baseball cards. Uh, I had a huge collection. In fact, I just read a couple weeks ago that Rick, Mickey Mantle's rookie card sold for several million dollars. I think I had that card, and I'm, I'm, I'm being honest here, because I was five when I started collecting baseball cards. And um, I followed men's sports, because that's what there was to follow. And yes, I knew of the Babe Diedrichs and the uh, swimmers and Gertrude Ederly and some of these people, but they didn't get a lot of press out. Uh, coverage. Um, I saved my babysitting money and bought Sport Magazine, and so I kept up that way, but the coverage was, you know, largely for uh, the men's sports and the men's activities. But I, I um, credit my parents for how I proceeded through life because um, they weren't athletic at all. You know, I get asked, how did I get involved in sports? Well, I don't know. I think it was in my genes. My parents weren't athletic. I have a brother that's a year younger than I am, and he is athletic, but he came after me, so he wasn't my role model or anything. And I can remember my mother telling the story that um, the woman across the street had three sons. And one day she came to my mother and said, do you think it's healthy for Mother Marcia to be uh, playing with the boys all the time? And my mother said, that's what she loves to do, and I don't see anything wrong with it. So if my mother had been the kind that thought that this was inappropriate or unladylike or something that young women and girls should not be doing, I might have pursued a different path. But my parents allowed me to be who I was, and so here I am. <laughs> so when did you first start playing organized sports. When, when did that occur? Was it a middle school, high school, elementary <laughs> school? Well, if you call GAA, the Girls Athletic Association, that's what we had in high school. We did not have interscholastic sports. I grew up in Napoleon, Ohio, so some of you may know where that is. And uh, we had a lot of very athletic young women in our school, but that's what our opportunities were. So. At the end of every sports season, we would have an all-star basketball game and an all-star volleyball game and an all-star field hockey game and so forth. But it was basically intramurals. That's what we had. Um, I, was, I was always on the all-star team. And my close friend in high school, she, um, they always put us on opposite teams. And I always prevailed, but well, I was taller than she was for one thing. But anyway, so they gave a award. You accumulated points for the sports that you played and the all-star teams that you were chosen to and so forth. And then at the end of the year, they would give an award to the senior athlete that had the most points. And that happened to be my, me. And then somebody nominated me for the Napoleon High School Hall of Fame. But because I only played intramural sports, that was not accepted, even though, you know, I was, you know, a, uh, what should I say? I was the best inter, inter <laughs> I, I was the best That's intramural true. player there was. Um, so they did induct me into their Distinguished Alumni Association or something like that. But anyway, I mean, that's how different things were back then, and I know that Bowling Green's done some things to recognize women that played before Title IX, like myself. Um, they, of course, didn't recognize me for my athletic ability here at Bowling Green because we were just starting. Yeah. And, uh, but I couldn't be considered for the Athletic Hall of Fame because 
I didn't play interscholastic or sports, so, yeah. You know, something you say resonates with me because we, we talk about coming through at different times, but I remember being in elementary school and I competed in a basketball contest and you had to do layups and free throws and, well, I, they wouldn't give it to me. I won the girls' portion of it, but because of my score, they wouldn't let me get the girls' trophy. I had to compete in the men's section, the boys' section, and finish third <laughs> in the boys' section. I wanted both. Yeah. So I'm like, can I just have both? But yeah, so you know, 30 years later, we're still having the same conversation. Right, right, right? exactly. So what led you to BG? Well, back in my day, um, if you were a woman, interested in sport, your only option was to be a PE teacher. That's how we all started. And, uh, you know, your r role models for careers for women, now there's exceptions, there's always exceptions, but you had to be an exceptional person or exceptional woman or be exposed to an exceptional person that motivated you. But you were a housewife and a mother, you were a nurse, you were a teacher or a secretary. Those were the four basic um, occupations we saw out there for women. So I became a physical education teacher. That's how I started. And that was if I wanted to pursue sports and I had a love of sports, that's what you did and that's what I did. So can you talk a little bit about your experience as, as a student athlete? So what your experience was like, practices, for competitions, um, how did you travel? What was the overall experience like for you? Well, we thought it was great <laughs> because we didn't have anything before. So, you know, it was so rudimentary compared to today or even 15 years after I played. It was very rudimentary. Um, I remember we played um, Ohio State in Michigan. I remember we went in a school bus. I remember we did not have uniforms. Um, when I was a physical education major, every class had their own color of shorts. And my class had green shorts. And then we had our blouses and we wore a pinny over the top and that was our uniform. And so the team might have players with green shorts and some with red shorts and some with brown shorts. I don't even remember what all the short colors were, but that was our uniform. Uh, the other times we went by car. I don't even remember what the score was or did we win or lose against Ohio State in uh, Michigan. But I remember that those were big opportunities. A funny story. Um, in 1997, when they were celebrating the 25th anniversary of Title IX, and you know, every major anniversary, suddenly the media is interested in women's sports. And so there's a big to-do, and then we wait another 10 or 15 or 20 years, and then there's another to-do about it. But anyway, uh, so they were celebrating the 25th anniversary of Title IX, and our local media, including the Spokane paper, if any of you know your geography, Pullman is about 25, or 25, it's 75 miles south of Spokane, Washington. Anyway, they wanted to do an article about me and my daughter who was um, playing basketball at WSU and she was maybe a junior, sophomore, I can't remember back then. <laughs> anyway, so they wanted pictures. So I go into my high school yearbook and there were a couple pictures of the all-star game, basketball, volleyball. One team was always the White Angels and the other team was always the Blue Devils. And um, <laughs> then they wanted an action shot. Well, the only action shot we could find was a picture of me playing intramurals and I was wearing a pencil skirt and a penny <laughs> um, in my bobby socks. So I thought, I went into uh, Bowling Green's yearbook, and there was a picture, our first year, 62-63, um, of the team. There was some scores. I think we played 10 or 12 games, and, and that was about it. So I thought, well, my senior year, there's gonna be more in there about the girls or the women's basketball team. 
Uh, there was absolutely nothing about the women's basketball team in the yearbook my senior year, so there were no pictures. Um, so things have changed dramatically, obviously, for the best. But you know, we appreciated what we had back then. It was a big deal to us because it was, it was so exciting because we'd never had this experience before, this opportunity that now um, young men and women take for granted. So. It's just out of curiosity, what were some of the schools that you did compete? You mentioned Michigan. Who were some of the other schools that you, you know, competed against? I should have looked that up because <laughs> I, <don't laughs> I don't even remember. I think we played Miami. Mm -hmm. um, but honest, the ones that st stood up to me were Michigan and Ohio State. Yeah, Ohio State. So can you compare your experiences that you had to what you tried to provide to your student athletes once you were in a position to do so? Well, obviously, um, men's athletics set the standard because they'd been around forever and they developed over a period of time. And those of you that have um, delved into some of the history of women's mm -hmm. intercollegiate sport and the AIW and then the NCA and so forth. Um, so basically, I tried to facilitate all of our athletes to have the same quality experience, whatever that might be. And it's changed just since I retired. Washington State University, they have a restaurant for our student athletes. Somebody, a shelf, chef cooks their meals every night. They have snacks 24 hours a day. Uh, we have a new facility, a beautiful weight room. Um, all of our athletes were in this dingy, dingy little weight room down in the bowels of what was Bowler Gym. Um, I'm proud to say that I was the facilitator after Title IX and we got some funding to build a facility that um, I was the person that chaired that committee and worked with the architects and so forth. But whatever it was, whatever it was we were going to provide student athletes, good, bad, or indifferent, it needed to provi be provided equitably for our men and women athletes. And so um, try to improve the experience for all of our student athletes, not just the women, um, but also for our men student athletes. And, but the, you know, the bottom line was the women had to ha have the opportunities that the men had. They had to have the support that the men had. They had to have the access to support <coughs> services that the men had. And then we can all grow and expand together. So looking past your time here at BG, and then you went into the real world, can you talk a little bit about what was your first job after college? Well, my first job after college was as a junior high physical education teacher in Los Angeles, California, Northeast LA. And that was an eye opener. Growing up in Napoleon, Ohio, we didn't have a whole lot of diversity in that community. And so teaching, uh, it was a wonderful experience and it actually helped me later in my career and helped me grow as a person because we had Asian students, we had African American students, we had Hispanic students, and you know, I grew up in a white community. So um, it really helped me to grow as a person and uh, really helped me later in my career because it expanded my horizons, it expanded my uh, knowledge of people and the diverse kinds of backgrounds people came from. Um, so yeah, that part of it, the teaching part and where I got to teach. I decided, I decided early on that I was going to go to California as soon as I graduated. And my grandparents had moved to California several years before, and so I just had this bug that I was going to move to California. And it's the best thing I ever did, because if I had stayed here, I would have taken a teaching job someplace, probably in an all-white community, and would never have had the great experience that I had in California. So you were in California, so you graduated in 64, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, while you were in California is when Title IX was actually passed in 72. Mm -hmm. It gets it really enacted in 78. Um, and you go to Washington State in 79. Uh, 79. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a, a little bit about how Title IX and that time frame how did that influence 
your career? Well, in 72, we had moved to Seattle and um, my husband was a teacher and we moved for his career at that time and I was pregnant at the time and so um, I did a lot of substitute teaching for a couple or three years in the Seattle area. But I got involved um, in coaching in the Seattle Parks and Rec Department and I met a woman named Ruth Smith who is um, the assistant director or whatever. She was second in command in, in Seattle Parks and Rec. And she came up to me one day and said, you know, you should get involved in officiating. And I go, what? She said, yeah, we really need officials because of Title IX, the opportunities were expanding in the high schools for girls' sports. And so I said, okay, I'll give it a try. Well, I ended up being a volleyball official and a basketball official, and I had national ratings at that time under the old NAGWS um, model. And uh, then I became the head of the officiating organization in Seattle, and then in the state, and then I was uh, head of the national rating team uh, nationally after that. So she was the one that really gave me the first opportunity to experience uh, the opportunities that Title IX would give women because of the, the boom in high school sports at that time. So then that's when I really figured out that I loved administration. I always thought I'd go back and be a PE teacher. And for some reason I was never interested in coaching. I don't know why, but I applaud you. <laughs> um, Anyway, so I went back to the University of Washington and got my master's degree in sports administration. And, um, you know, one of the questions I think I read was they were going to ask about my mentors. And honestly, I would say that I really never had a mentor. I never had somebody that I always fell back on to seek advice. But I had people that gave me the opportunity. And Ruth Smith was the person that gave me an opportunity. And then I took that opportunity and ran with it. And in grad school, uh, a person named Kit Green was the women's athletic director, and she gave me an internship. And so I took that opportunity and ran with it. And then uh, through officiating uh, around the state of Washington, the ex assistant executive director of the high school association got me involved in doing clinics around the state. And then I was hired at Washington State to be the uh, assistant women's athletic director. At that time, there were two separate departments. I think I only got the job because I was well known in the state through the officiating clinics and so forth. So I had people, women, that gave me opportunities. And then I just kind of, I'm kind of an independent sort, and I just kind of took those opportunities and ran with them wherever they took me. And that, well, that's a great lead into my next question, which was once you got into administration, how did you progressively take on additional responsibilities um, and get that experience, especially being a woman in a very male-dominated profession? How were you able to take on those responsibilities and get the opportunity to show that you could do that? Well when I was in women's athletics, we were um, a separate department for three years and then we uh, merged into men's athletics. And of course, when I was in women's athletics, there were just two administrators, the AD and me. And so I did a lot of the marketing, I did a promotion, I did the facility stuff, I did a lot, all of those kinds of things. Um, so that gave me a, a broad experience. And then when we merged, you know, one of the things I wanted to do is learn more about football. So I volunteered. Actually, I started volunteering the year before we merged. Um, there was uh, the associate, associate AD on the men's side uh, that I had to work with a lot because we were always trying to schedule facilities because, you know, both departments um, use them. And so we had a good relationship. And so he was in charge of football. Uh, game operations and so I volunteered and I worked football game operations and then after we merged son, suddenly I was in charge of it because he <laughs> left. Um, so just um, seeking out experiences so that I could learn and grow and a lot of it though was just by you learn by doing. You learn by doing and uh, 
you make mistakes and hopefully you don't trip up too badly and you can move forward. But um, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's interesting how when you talk uh, about our profession, sometimes there's a very prescribed pathway of how people got to the AD chair. But then there's also this just opportunities came up in regards to nobody else wanted the job. Mm -hmm. So nobody wanted to take on HR, nobody wanted to take on sports med. And you take those things on and then you, that's your progression. And that's right. why I always tell people, if something comes open and the department needs help, dive in because otherwise you may not get that experience to do that. Yeah. Well, I think one of the questions I read was something about advice about the best position to learn in athletics. And I will tell you, I think, and that this opinion has never changed, facilities and event operations. Because um, a person I hired at Washington State in that, as I had other responsibilities and couldn't do as much of the, that day-to-day -day stuff, he's now the AD at San Diego State University. And another person that um, I hired in that kind of position went on to be become an associate AD and so forth. But in facilities and event operations, you deal with every area of the department. I dealt with all the coaches. I dealt with marketing. I dealt with sports information. I dealt with every single area of the department and got to understand those people and what they do and what their role in the big picture was. So I don't, my own, and I'm biased. Dan may disagree with me because, raise your hand, Dan. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just, there's not another area of the department that gets to work so closely with so many different entities than event and facilities operations. Mm -hmm. And so, so, and I'm sticking to that. Stick, sticking to it. <laughs> so at what point in your career, and, and we are going to touch on the reality of what being an AD is and the perception of what being an AD is. But at what point in your career did you go, you know what, I'm ready. And I, and, but the second part of that is, I'm ready and I actually want to do this. Mm -hmm. So at what point in your career did you come to that decision? And what led you to that decision? Well, um, at the point I'd been interim AD twice, <laughs> I decided, hey, I could do this job. And um, I... Uh, but I wasn't willing to just go anywhere to do it because I had a great career at Washington State. I liked what I did. I was being paid sufficiently back then. But uh, interesting story, one of the uh, people in fundraising approached me about three months ago wanting me to make a bequest to the Title IX fund at Washington State. And I said, you know, at some point I will do something. but." You know, I worked before athletic administrators were making big bucks. <laughs> so um, I need to go a little further down the road and see where my two daughters, uh, they are and things like that. But um, yeah. Um, and so I was uh, a candidate for uh, the athletic director position at Washington State. And Washington State does not generally, well, they don't have a history of hiring from within. So I was told I had to go somewhere else and be AD mm -hmm. before I could come back to be AD at Washington State. Oh, okay. And then, so I applied for Bowling Green, which is the only place I would have applied for in this part of the country, ever. And I was a finalist, and I came in for an interview, but someone else got the job. So anyway, so I finished my career <laughs> at Washington State, and I had a great career. I don't have any regrets. But it's one of those things you always wondered, could you really have done it? Would you have been any good at it? I don't know. We'll never know. We'll never know. Yeah. So let's go to the actual versus the perceived from, from your perspective. And I think, you know, and I'll, I'll share this story just as um, a little humor. So prior to getting the interim tag, interim athletic director, I felt like I was pretty smart. I was a problem solver. Felt like I could communicate well. Within 12 hours of getting the title and the tag, I got my first hate mail. And apparently I was an idiot <laughs> and I had no idea. So can you talk a little bit about the, what is the, what people perceive an athletic director role to be 
and what it truly is. Hmm. Well, I think they perceive it as being very powerful and attractive and glamorous, but it's not. It's just a heck of a lot of hard work and you take a lot of grief. And I got some hate mitt because I supervise a lot of sports. I supervise the strength and conditioning staff. and um, Well, I supervise at one time or another just about every area of the department, except for football and men's basketball. Um, but I know right now the, the person that was my administrative assistant is still the administrative assistant for the person uh, that took my place. And because of personnel issues, she's also the administrative assistant for the athletic director right now. So she sees all of his hate mail, and I don't know, you guys probably don't follow West Coast sports that much, but um, our football coach was let go because he wouldn't get vaccinated. I don't know, have any of you read that story or heard about it? Yeah, well you of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we just hired a new football coach. He'd been there for one season, and then it was the mandate of the state of Washington that all the state employees had to be vaccinated, and he wouldn't do it and unless you could make an accommodation. Well, the athletic director felt that there couldn't be an accommodation because he can't um, be running around all over the country wearing a mask all the time and... Um, even when we didn't have to, well anyway, I won't go into the details. <laughs> but, um, so they ended up uh, letting him go. He um, is now suing the university. I don't know where that is. We haven't heard much about it lately. And his assistant took over in the interim and then was hired permanently and we're three and zero and he's doing a great job so far, knock on wood. But uh, the hate mail that came in to the athletic director over that uh, was mind-boggling. That people should care that much about that, about football, about sport. And I was um, telling somebody earlier, I felt for a long time that sport in this country has become too important for too many of the wrong reasons and not enough of the right reasons. And whether it's kids sports or how you know, people give you a nickel and they think they should have um, a lot of say in the decision making of your department and how you carry out your business. Uh, it's a, it's a, a very unique environment to work in and to live in. And um, somewhere, I mean, it's great that our fans are passionate. That's great. But I wish more of them understood what their role it was, and their role is to support our student athletes and go out and cheer them. And our student bodies, you know, if you care about sports, if you don't care about sports, that's fine. But if you care about sports, go out and cheer for our team. Don't cheer against the other team. Um, I don't know if you saw there was a, an issue with um, BYU. Um, who went out and put, somebody from back here went out and played BYU in volleyball. Duke. Duke, Duke yes. Duke. And mm -hmm. so derogatory uh, remarks were made against the African-American player on the Duke team. And so um, then BYU played Oregon in football, mm -hmm. I think. I think it was football. Mm -hmm. And the Oregon uh, students are yelling you know, F BYU. And so BYU isn't going to play Oregon anymore. I mean, that kind of behavior is just uncalled for, unnecessary, and it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. It really doesn't intimidate the other team. It's not going to make them lose because you yelled nasty things at them. You know, they've heard it. They're focusing on what they're playing. So from that standpoint, um, in this country, I just think things have to settle down a little bit about sport and what its true value is and what it does for the participants. Um, and especially at the college level and the high school level. The important thing is what it's doing for those young men and women and what they're getting out of it and how it's going to impact them for the rest of their lives 
And for those of us who support that, that work in administration, whether it's fundraising or sports information or um, just general administration or whatever it is, we need to focus on helping them become mm -hmm. the best people that they can become during that time. You know, I always say the, uh, the athletic director gets, if something goes wrong in sports medicine, the athletic director gets the email the next day. And then they shove it down to the associate athletic director. <laughs> right? <laughs> they, they, we, it just pushes it on down. Yeah. But when something really good happens, very seldom do you hear about it. Yeah. Right? And to be able to, to say, you know, we did a really good job. We think we did, but we never hear. So, so I think you talked a little bit. That's probably the most difficult part of the job in some aspect. What for you was the most rewarding part of the job? Well, I just think... Um, seeing our student athletes grow and develop from when they come in as freshmen, uh, some very mature, some very immature, uh, and how they take this experience and uh, take advantage of this experience. And then they leave um, more mature, uh, have a better perspective, I think, about life, how they want to go forward. So in working with the colleagues I worked with, I mean, those are the two things, is people, it, every job, I don't care what jo job you're in, I don't care what you do, it's all about people, and it's all about relationships, and who you work with, and those types of things, so. And for the sport management people in here, I would say, um, and I used to lecture in our sport management classes quite often, be sure you're doing it for the right reason. Be sure you're d not doing it because you think this is gonna be a glamorous glamorous job and oh college athletics well that'll be a lot of fun that'll be a great career you know be sure you have a passion for what you're going into and you're going into it for the right reasons because if you do it well yeah there's people that slack off and slide by and you know might get by on their personality or charisma for a while but if you do it right it's hard work it's rewarding but it's hard work Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a lifestyle, mm -hmm. for sure. So, nine to five, Monday through Friday, that that really doesn't exist in this world because no. we're playing on holidays, day before holidays, universities closed. Right. So, for sure. And if you have families, you know they're impacted tremendously because you're gone a lot. Uh, a lot of times, your holidays are taking up with some event or another. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So do you think your experiences were good, were better, worse, or just different by being a woman in this profession? Well, they were different. <laughs> um, they weren't, I wouldn't say they were, well, in some ways they were better in the aspect of uh, when we first merged, uh, the AD at that particular time, um, and he was only there a year after we merged, but he didn't know what to do with me, because there were no other, the only women in the department, the men's department, were secretaries. So I'm sitting in, this, uh, we had our weekly staff meetings, and there's me and 17 guys, and this particular AD was really kind of hard on his staff, so he was one of the, every AD I worked for, they had their strengths and their weaknesses, as we all do. But he was the kind that, if things went bad, you took the blame, and if things went good, he took the credit. But I would sit in those meetings, and he would just tear these guys apart, and I would just sit there and cringe and think, oh God, I hope he doesn't. Well, he didn't know what to do with me, so he just let me do my thing and whatever, and I did. Um, and so I was, I was really fortunate. All of the responsibilities I had, all the AADs that I worked for, pretty much essentially, I just went and did my thing. And um, I'm not even sure they knew what I was doing half the time. <laughs> <laughs> Which is okay, yeah, right? right. <laughs> it was good. So, gonna gonna jump a little bit. So, there's always been an arms race in athletics, mm -hmm. right? Between the haves and the have-nots, and it was facilities, 
was a big one, um, and I think that's been a, a battle for a while. Um, now we've got NIL, uh, name, image, and likeness, and student athletes can actually make money off of their name, image, and likeness. So what do you think the lasting effects of name, image, and likeness is going to be on college athletics? Hmm. So you think I'm a seer? I do. <laughs> I'm hoping. I'm hoping someone is a seer. I, you know, I wish that I knew. I will say this. Um, the minute they started paying coaches millions of dollars, those of us old folks, we knew this was coming down the line. Sooner or later, the student athletes were going to revolt, if you will. Not a major revolt like, you know, marching in the streets or anything, but they were going to push back. And um, how it turned out with the NIL is, you know, I wish I knew. I don't. I have no clue how this might all go down, but I know that at Washington State, you know, Washington State, we're in a big time conference, but we're very much like Bowling Green, right? Very much like Bowling Green. And the opportunities available in our local community, or even if we go to Spokane, of course in Spokane we have to fight Gonzaga basketball, um, there, there just aren't those kinds of commercial enterprises that are going to be able to step up to the plate in a major way for our student athletes. Mm -hmm. And how they're going to manage it, because supposedly the athletic departments aren't supposed to have anything to do with it. We're not supposed to broker, correct? Yes, but we know that that's not going to happen. Um, so I don't know down the line how it's all going to play out. I know that, you know, a lot of us thought the whole thing would have blown up by now. Once the, the facilities arm race uh, came about and coaches were making millions of dollars a year and all this, some of us, this can't keep it's up, this can't last. Yeah. Well, it did and it probably will keep going, but it'll be very different. And how that difference is going to impact student athletes and staff, I don't know. But I wonder about, for example, if the quarterback on the uh, football team has a million dollar deal going and his center is getting nothing, how does that impact the locker room? Right. You know, when you have, um, here's a, an example. I did a presentation last week with three of our coaches, and the soccer coach was part of it. And uh, WSU went to the women's Final Four in soccer right before the pandemic. And uh, Tiffany Rodman, who's Dennis Rodman's daughter, signed to play soccer with us and she's one of evidently now she's making a million dollars a year as a pro soccer player but she signed with WSU and was going to come to WSU but then the pandemic hit and she had the opportunity to go pro and so she did that but he was making the point if she was at WSU um, she would have a huge opportunity for some kind of NIL deal but the rest of our soccer players wouldn't mm -hmm. And how would that impact the locker room? So I think, you know, going down the line, this NIL thing, I mean, I think that's one of the huge issues is how it's going to impact the individuals on a team when it's, there's a differentiation between who signs with what and who gets what and whatever. Mm -hmm. so. so let's expand it a little bit more. And going down the NIL track, though, and its impact on gender equity. Because again, we're not supposed to be right. brokering, we're not involved in those deals, but yet and still, we're gonna be held responsible mm -hmm. what the differential is. Right. But we're not supposed to be involved with it. So can, can you share a little bit about the impact on Title IX? Well, obviously there's going to be an impact. Maybe OCR is gonna to have to come up with some new rules. I don't know, Maybe. but uh, yeah, it's a sticky wicket. Uh, where's the lacrosse people, <laughs> uh, to say the least? And uh, that's a huge concern is how it's going to impact um, gender equity. And uh, you know, I wish I could say or yeah. have a definitive idea or uh, 
could see into the future, but I don't know. I just think it's going to be a mess, is what I think. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, my colleagues and I are happy to be retired at this point in time. <laughs> well, let's stay on the messy topics. Uh, let's get those out of the way. So there's a lot of conversation right now, and I think there's at least two cases out in Pennsylvania, or up in Pennsylvania, about student athletes being employees. Mm -hmm. So as we look at just college and athletics in general, when we start classifying our student athletes as employees, what rabbit hole does that take us down? Well, I think the rabbit hole is deeper for the student athletes maybe than it is for the university and the athletic department because once you become an employee, you know, you're going to have to pay income taxes, you're going to have to do everything that you're going to have to do when you get out of here and have a real job. Um, I think the difference for student athletes is going to be tremendous um, and I'm not sure they're going to like it. And also, when you become an employee, were you going to have uh, the support services that are supplied? Are you going to have an uh, eating plan? Are you going to have access to the training facilities and all of these things that you have total access to now? Because that's a total different relationship between being a student athlete and a scholarship student athlete or even a walk-on student athlete and being an employee of the university. Total different deal. And I think in the long run, especially given um, how universities have increased their support for student athletes, whether it's in nutrition, whether it's in strength and conditioning, whether it's mental health or whatever it is, um, it, it's going to be a different world, and I'm not sure it's going to be a better world for our student athletes. Yeah. So the tough question being, um, and, and you and I talked a little bit about the transformational committee, and, mm -hmm. and the, the NCA is now going through uh, a transformational state where they're making decisions on what college athletics is going to look like. Um, as early as January of 2023, I think they'll be making some recommendations, and athletics is going to look very different. I think. So based on some of the things we've talked about, whether it's the, the arms race, whether it's NIL, whether it's student athletes as employees. The portal. The portal, the, tra the, the transfer portal. Do you feel like that the NCA amateur model can thrive, or I would even say survive, everything that we're dealing with now? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I think it'll uh, survive and thrive at Division Two and Division Three, but I think it'll be very, very difficult at our level because I think the um, the division between the haves, if you will, mm -hmm. and the have-nots is going to increase. It's not going to decrease. It's going to get larger and bigger, and. Um, you know, our situations are a little different because in the MAC, the schools are all fairly similar, I would assume. Mm -hmm. But in the Pac-12, you know, there's Washington State and Oregon State, and then there's the other schools. And so whatever happens down the line with, uh, you know, the poaching of the Southeast Conference or the Big Ten, I mean, schools like Washington State are um, in jeopardy, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. And right now, the 10 schools that will be left in two years after uh, USC and UCLA leave to join the Big Ten, um, according to the athletic director, and I just was talking to him this weekend, they're sticking strong, they're going to stick together, and they're going to whatever. Um, and a lot of it's going to depend on what kind of a television deal that they mm -hmm. can strike. Um, the good thing is the ESPN is not involved in the Big Ten or the Southeast Conference, so that it's going to be up to the commissioner and the ADs and the uh, PAC-12 to uh, sell it, that it's going to be lucrative for ESPN to spend big bucks on the Big 12, or PAC-12. Um, in the meantime, there's these rumors out there from the Big 12 that they'd like some of our schools. So, you know, Washington State is in a difficult position, potentially, down the road. Um, 
but uh, the, the whole landscape is going to change. And I know even the, the people in the business, um, in the Pac-12, how's this going to impact men's baseball and men's wrestling and women's gymnastics and women's volleyball? And we're going to be, they're going to be flying teams from California to Ohio on a regular basis, and how does that impact the student athlete experience? Now, I have to say I get a kick out of it. Every time <laughs> big time athletics makes one of these changes, it's always couched with, this is in the good of the student athlete experience. Well, how, you can't tell me that flying teams from one coast to the other is a good experience for student athletes. What happens with their academics? How many mm -hmm. more classes are they gonna miss than they're already missing? Are they really going to charter the volleyball team um, every other week to fly to Ohio? Uh, I mean, there's just so many unknowns out there, and I just can't think that there's any real benefit for student athletes. Obviously, for those institutions, they think um, they're going to make more money, and that's going to benefit student athletes. Well, I'll tell you, the student athletes at USC and UCLA have a great experience right now. Mm -hmm. And a l more money isn't going to make it any better. It may make their coaches be paid more money. Uh, maybe they'll be able to remodel uh, the Rose Bowl Stadium or something like that. But it's not going to make the student athlete experience any better. So you touched on kind of those super conferences that are that are coming about, whether Southeastern Conference, Big Ten. Can how do you think schools in the group of five or even FCS at the Division One level, how do you we remain relevant and how do we even compete? And on top of that, from a from a gender equity standpoint, because schools that are already on the cusp trying to play with the big boys and don't have the resources to do that, the resources are coming from somewhere, right? It's impacting another experience. Right. So how can those institutions, one, stay relevant, and two, still provide a, a, a great experience for those Olympic sports? You know, I guess what I think is the whole landscape is going to change so much and you're going to be try to be relevant in a different environment. It's not going to be the environment we have right now. You're not going to be, try to be relevant with Ohio State or whoever. Um, it's going to be a different environment, a different structure, a different scenario, and you're going to be trying to be relevant in that area. And for example, Let's say the whole thing falls through with the uh, Pac-12 and um, the Big 12, they can't get the television deal. It doesn't make, financially, they can't stay together as the Pac-12. So uh, the Big 12 poaches Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, and Colorado. And then Oregon and Cal jump to the Big 10 and then at least Oregon State and Washington, oh, Washington would go to the, the Big Ten too. And so then maybe they will go to the Mountain West Conference and then we would try to be relevant in that conference. I mean, wherever you end up, you're gonna try to be relevant. Yeah. You just might be trying to be relevant in a different environment than we are in now. So it's deciding who you are first. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, as we celebrate 50 years of Title IX, um, you know, actually I did a presentation back in April and it was called 50 Years of Title IX, the SWA designation, 50 Years of Progress, question mark. And the question mark was intentional. Um, and I would love to hear from your perspective. After 50 years, where have we been successful? Like where have we seen that progress? And where have we fallen short? Um, well, the SWA designation did help mm -hmm. because there were a lot of schools that didn't have a woman in their senior administration. Um, there were some schools that actually made the sports secretary their SWA. So it did um, open more opportunities. But then, you know, it's sort of like, okay, we have our one woman now. 
And that's, we've made that jump and we've, you know, checked off that box. And so we're all set. And um, there's just a whole lot of schools still that only have one woman in their senior athletic administration. Um, and for me, uh, you know, I was in administrative structures where I was one of, with four guys, five guys, six guys, seven guys. And then two, three athletic directors ago, um, they elevated um, a woman that I had hired. And so she was part of the senior administration. Then a new AD came in and uh, he brought a, um, his SWA from his previous school. And so there were three of us. And it made a huge amount of difference for me because before, you know, I was always having to play these mental games when issues would come up, and a lot of times I brought issues up. Um, is this really important? Uh, is this something I can let go? How strong do I have to fight for this? Um, I have to watch my words. I have to be careful how I approach this. I have to be strategic. I have to be diplomatic. You know, because if you're a feisty woman, you're a pain in the, you know what, to people. <laughs> um, and you've all probably seen this, but it's still true today. I mean, women who have same kind of uh, um, personalities or tendencies that men have, men are uh, adulated for that and women are criticized. Um, you know, if you're a, a male with a strong personality and you're out there and if you're the woman, you're a bitch. Um, and uh, so you're always playing these political games in your mind, but then when another woman and then another woman came into the senior structure, it's not that we all agreed on everything, because we didn't. We're all very different personalities. But it was more than likely that if I didn't say it, one of them would. And so I didn't always have to be the thorn in everybody's <laughs> side. It's basically what it amounted to. But um, it's really important that we have, well, more women in our fundraising. This is one of the things that uh, always kind of thorn in my side at WSU. They never had any women in the fundraising area out really soliciting people, soliciting people to give to WSU. We just had uh, introduction uh, to our Hall of Fame of our 1991 women's basketball team, which was the first women's basketball team that went to the NSA tournament, and we didn't get back for another 30 years. We just got back two years ago. And so there's a couple lawyers, there's a couple doctors, there's people in high-powered positions, and not one of them has ever been asked for a penny from the athletic department. Uh, and we have a whole slew of former women athletes like that. Um, so there's a lot of areas in the athletic department that need strong women in various aspects of, uh, of administration, whether it's development or whether it's general administration or whether it's sports information or whatever the case may be. And um, we just need more of them. Agreed. So on our career journeys, mm -hmm. and you touched on a few in your career uh, of individuals, and, and not so much mentors, but individuals who impacted your career or molded you into the administrator that you are. And I would even say sometimes those are positive influences mm -hmm. and sometimes they're negative influences, right? You see people and you're like, I am never gonna be that administrator, <laughs> right? You don't have to call those people out. <laughs> but, but who were some people along the way for you that helped truly mold you into the administrator that you became? Well, there were colleagues um, in the conference that I really admired that had a lot more experience than I did. Judy Holland was one. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, women's athletics in um, the Pac-10 at the time, she was at UCLA. Barbara Hedges was at USC. Uh, Mary Roby was at Arizona. Um, and so when women's athletics went into the Pac-10, um, before, we, there was a southern, the southern schools were in a conference and the northern schools were in a conference and we were in a conference with 
uh, San Jose State and uh, UOP and schools like that in the north, and then the women went into the Pac-10. And so those were legends in women's athletics um, that I really admired and looked up to, and um, I think I learned a lot from them and being in meetings with them and uh, seeing their style. I'll never forget Judy, well, Judy Holland and Barbara Hedges, Janet probably doesn't like them because they were advocates for <laughs> women going to the NCAA as opposed to staying in the AIW. Um, but those are old battles many years ago. But you know, they're interesting history if any of you are interested in that. Um, but anyway, there were strong women like that that had been in it for years, had lots of experience, and uh, um, they kind of took me in as one of them, which was gratifying and educational, and it was not like, oh, here's this newbie coming in, and what does she know? Um, they were very open, and yeah, we became close friends. So those were the easy questions. Now we're gonna go into the hard-hitting questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So as, as part of, I'm gonna call tradition, uh, the first Maxwell conversation devised a series of questions to end the conversation. So we're gonna dive into those, oh, those okay. questions. What did you wanna be when you were growing up? <laughs> well, I guess a PE teacher. I can't remember, you know, thinking about being anything else until I found out that that's what, if you were a woman and a girl interested in sports, that's what you did. So that's what that's I what wanted to be. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember ever wanting to be anything else. I never wanted to be a fireman or anything like that or a baseball player. I mean, I would have liked to have been a baseball player, but I got the message back then that girls couldn't play baseball, so whatever. So who inspired you most in your life? Um, I'd say my parents, uh, just as I, I already mentioned, because they allowed me to, to be who I was. What is the most embarrassing moment from your career? You know, I, you know, they gave me these questions ahead of time, and I can't think of a most embarrassing time. I can think of different times when I wish I had uh, made a different decision or acted differently in a relationship with a colleague. Um, but I really honestly don't remember. I'm sure there is one. I'm sure there's a most embarrassing situation out there that somebody remembers that I did, but um, I, I don't remember a most embarrassing situation. Okay. What's your proudest moment? Oh, actually, I could, <laughs> Here, here's here's a, an embarrassing situation. I'm not sure it's the most, but it just happened at the Hall of Fame thing at WSU this past weekend. So they honored five of us as Title IX pioneers, and we went up in the stage, and they lowered this banner, and people took pictures, and my pant leg was up to like this. <laughs> so one, one pant leg was up, and one pant leg was down. And I don't know how that pant leg got up, and I don't know how it fell back down, because I didn't even know it was up at one time. And then all the pictures, here I am, with one pant leg up and one pant. So that was embarrassing. And no one told you? Nobody told me until afterwards. Nobody, you know, I had friends out there that if they had yelled out, Marsha, pull your pant leg down, I would have, oh, okay, yeah. But no, nobody told me. No one told you. So what's your proudest moment from your career? Um... That's a hard one. You know, honestly, uh, being inducted into Bowling Green's Hall of Fame and then Washington State's Hall of Fame, I mean, um, they were very proud moments. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite food? <laughs> now that's a hard one. That is a hard one. <laughs> Actually, I'd have to say fruit. I love fruit, any kind of fruit. So yeah, I would have to say fruit. But okay. if I had to pick something that was more on the meaty side, I would say scallops are my favorite. But okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Still healthy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So last question. If you could be a bird, what would it be? A cardinal. <laughs> Yay, I love car I love birds. I'm kind of a bird watcher person and I love birds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was supposed to say falcon. <laughs> oh, see, I'm just being honest. 
That's right. That's Although right. I like falcons. I love cardinals. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have any any cardinals out in the west, but we, we do have falcons. We do have falcons. Yeah, out there. Yeah, out there so. Okay. Well, that's all the structured questions that we have. We would love to open it up to the audience uh, for any questions that, that you may have for Marsha. If you do have a question, there's a um, handheld mic here. Just uh, let them know. Did they come to you or do you go to them? All right. We have a question over here. <laughs> Got to get your running shoes on. Do you think there's like any other benefits other than payout that like small division programs get by playing bigger schools? Um, you know, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that because I think the uh, answer is in how do student athletes feel about that. Um, I, if the athletes feel that there's a benefit for Bowling Green to play Ohio State, then yeah. But if they just go in there and get beat up and injured, then no. Um, so that's really a thing to ask student athletes um, about how they feel about it. And I'm sure student athletes have different thoughts about that. Some may think, oh, this is a great opportunity. Yeah, I want to go play Ohio State. And others say, is it really worth it? I don't know. Good question. Mm -hmm. Um, did you get calls from parents when you were an AD? And if so, were there problems or concerns different from men and women? Mm. Um, I would say the parents of women athletes were more concerned about the treatment of their coaches towards the women student athletes. Not that it was uh, necessarily bad or horrible or anything, but more concerned about that than the parents of male student athletes. You know, I've seen all of our coaches coach, and uh, some of the coaches of our male student athletes, they were very tough, they were harsh, they were this and that. Didn't really get a lot of call from parents about that. But if a woman um, might be really um, vocal, um, harsh, had a harsh um, demeanor. Yeah, parents are very protective about their women student athletes more than they are about the men. I think on the men's side, it's sort of like, you know, they expect it, and that's how men are raised is to be tough. Men need to be raised to be more compassionate and empathetic, really. Um, but our women learn to be tough. There's no doubt about that, but yeah, there were. Although I had a um, father of a baseball player come in one time, and uh, we had just changed coaches, and you know he uh, probably wasn't the best coaching choice. Great person, great person, but probably not the best coaching choice. And he came in to complain to me about the coach, and um, it was stuff that the student athletes should have been discussing with the coach, not with, you know, not the father discussing it with me. And so I told him that. I said, you know, coach so-and-so, he's open, he's amenable, you know, your son needs to go talk to him. And then we had a back and forth conversation. I finally said to him, I hope you sent your son to college to grow, to be a man. You didn't send him to college for you to take care of his problems. And he just kind of looked at me and thanked me and <laughs> left. <laughs> so, um, but some of our academic uh, counselors, they would have mothers come in with their daughter or their son and sit down with them to talk about their class schedule and what it was going to be. You know, when I went to college, we stood in line out there in whatever that facility was where we registered for classes. 
And we stood in line for hours to register paper and pencil for classes. <laughs> My mother wouldn't have known how to register for me for all the money in China. But uh, yeah, parents very, very involved in some of these things. And um, you know, I'd like to think our student athletes, um, maybe they come in and they're naive and, uh, but that's, that's what they're at the university for, to learn and to grow and to be independent people and not have mom and dad take care of them and solve all their problems for them. And I, I think that's really unfortunate, frankly. Okay, we got four questions going. We got one here and three <coughs> kind of center there. What do you think is the biggest similarity between Washington State and BG? Well, they're not that different in size, actually. What's a what's a student or what's the population here now? Twenty thousand, but I think it's down some. Yeah, yeah, that's what we are about twenty thousand. Um, sometimes a little more. We're down a little bit too mm -hmm. right now. I guess the pandemic did that to mm -hmm. most everybody. Um, so we're very similar in size. Um, Pullman's a very small community, actually smaller than Bowling Green is, and uh, it's not like you know. Out west, um, we're very far apart. For example, you can, Bowling Green, you can be to Chicago or mm -hmm. Cleveland or Cincinnati or Columbus in what, two hours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in two hours I'd be out in the middle of the state of Washington <laughs> <laughs> going west. Going east, I would be out in the middle of the state of Idaho. Um, so, yeah, going north, I'd be in Canada. <laughs> So it's very different out there, um, so it's hard to compare. But as far as the um, uh, focus of the universities, there, you know, of course, WSU is a major research institution, which I guess Bowling Green is not considered that. But I know there's a lot of good research going on here. But as far as the kind of students you get and we get, I, I would guess that they're very, very similar. Um, yeah, you know, as I said, I'm very proud to be a Bowling Green graduate. Um, actually, my first trip to Bowling Green was, here I was recruited. I was recruited to Bowling Green, not to be a PE major or a basketball player. My high school chemistry teacher thought I was wasting my time going into physical education. He wanted me to become a chemistry teacher. Mm -hmm. So he brought me to Bowling Green and we toured the science department and I met all the professors there. <laughs> Honest to God, like I was being <laughs> recruited as an athlete, although I didn't make that comparison back then because I didn't know athletics or athletes were recruited either. <laughs> but yeah, that was my first vis visit to Bowling Green is to try to convince me that I should be a chemistry teacher. Mm -hmm. I will tell you a funny story, though. It's, it's not about embarrassment, or it's not even about athletics. And this just happened two weeks ago. I was driving to Idaho. I was in the middle of a project, because I volunteer for a nonprofit. I was volunteering, and I had this important thing that I needed to do, and I was needed to print it up, and my computer ran, uh, or my printer ran out of ink. So I had to drive to Moscow, Idaho, which is eight miles away, and the University of Idaho is over there. My husband graduated from the University of Idaho. So we have two major institutions eight miles apart. And uh, I just had cr almost to the border of Idaho. My car always says, welcome to Idaho. And I see these flashing lights <laughs> in the back. So I pull over and this young police officer comes over and my wedding there and he roll it down and he says, do you know how fast you were going? Or no, do you know what the speed limit is here? And I said, yeah, it's 55. Do you know how fast you were going? Well, I was probably going 60 because that's what I usually go on this road. Well, I clocked you at 65 or 66. I go, oh, well, you know, usually I set my c cruise control in this road for that very reason, but I didn't do that today. So I give him all my stuff, my driver's license, my shirts, and he goes back to his SUV and he's there for a while and then he comes back and gives me my stuff and he says, well, I'm not going to tell you what to do, 
because you've been driving longer than I've been alive. <laughs> I go, oh, thanks a lot. He goes, oh, no, I don't mean any disrespect or anything like that. Go, okay, thank you. I'm just going to give you a warning. All right, great, None thanks. <laughs> anyway, that's an old age story. That's not a sports story. <laughs> What would you recommend as the best job to have in college sports? Oh. Well, it depends on what your interests are. You know, a lot of people aspire to be an athletic director, well, especially our, the men. More women are aspiring, but the men all come in and want to be AD. Uh, then some of them get to and probably wish they hadn't aspired to that. Um, I think you really have to assess what, what you what your personality is. Um, the AD job can be the best job in the world if, if you know you have the personality and the fortitude and the interpersonal skills and all mm -hmm. those kinds of things that go into it. You want to work that hard. But there are a lot of lucrative jobs in all areas of the department, whether you know you love the media and you love sports information or you're into the health sciences and you want to be an athletic trainer. I, I think it I don't think there is the best job. I think it, there's the best job for that individual person. And sometimes people don't find, especially when people always want to be the AD, I'm not sure a lot of those people ever find their best job because some of them get it and it wasn't the job they were meant for. And others don't get it and maybe should have had that opportunity. So it's a very individual thing in my mind. Arguably, we've seen a lot more focus on social emotional wellness in mm -hmm. college athletics. How do you think that's changing the landscape and relationships within collegiate athletics between coaches, athletes, administrators? Um, we were, you know, starting to see. I mean, so, see some of this when when I was still working. In fact, Washington State hired the first uh, sports psychologist in the Pac-12. But that person was hired at the time because of the concern about performance enhancing drugs. So back at that time in the 90s, <clears throat> they were a huge concern. And that's about when the NCAA you know, started drug testing. And then in the state of Washington, you can't randomly drug test. You have to drug test based on reasonable suspicion. So there were all kinds of issues we went through. But of course, this person got involved in other aspects of a student athlete's uh, health behaviors. And uh, so obviously, there's a lot more resources devoted to that. But I think it's also created um, more tension sometimes between, from what I hear, coaches and student athletes. In fact, I was talking to our rowing coach and she was saying, um, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't downplaying the mental health issues and the pressures that student athletes feel, but she felt like some student athletes were using it as an excuse to, you know, she wants them just be tougher, you know, I mean, Student athletes um, coming in and saying, Coach, I need a mental health day. What does that mean exactly? I need a mental health day. I, you know, what's going on with you that you feel that you can't come to practice today? So um, I think that's become a, kind of a sticky wicket um, with coaches and student athletes. And obviously, you want, to, if you're a coach, you're going to err on the side of, yes, this person needs a mental health day. I mean, nobody wants to cross that line, but it's created situations where um, um, trust issues, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I could expand um, just a little bit on it, I mean, I think there is, so it's becoming more prevalent on the national level, so it's in part of the discussions with the Transformational Committee and you know, in order to be Division One, do you have to invest at a certain level um, in the care of a student athlete? Um, it's on the conference level. We have that conversation with our, our COSA group and um, the resources that they need. And I think as administrators, 
it is our job to provide those resources and help put what I call tools in the toolbox, right? It's not our job to fix every problem, it's our job to figure out how we can get you the tools to deal with the problems that come your way. Now, when, when I say that, you know, we have a, a life coach. We have, we, we've hired a director of student athlete mental health services. We work with a counseling center. We work with the dean of students. Like it is a, it definitely takes a village um, to provide all of those tools. And I think on the coach's side, the hard part is that they are still being held accountable for performance-based, right? And there is no clear definition. It's, it, it's not like when you have a physical injury and we're trying to close that gap on the understanding of what mental health is and how do we navigate that. And coaches are not mental health experts. Like I think we forget that, that piece of it. So when student athletes come to them and say, I need a mental health day, where do they pack that? And where do they unpack that? So it, it's definitely a sticky wicket that um, you know, we're having to navigate, and I do feel for our coaches trying to, to navigate that. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's one down here. Hmm. He's going to get his 10,000 steps in today. That's all right. Hello. Um, so my question is not related to sport. Um, I'm a grad student here, second year PhD in leadership policy, and it has more to do with some. Uh, you know, you mentioned. Uh, it seems like you know you had uh, support from your family and parents, and uh, you mentioned something about how you did not have a mentor, but rather you had opportunities and you ran with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, if you had the choice now to have a mentor or work with them. Would you have, and if so, how do you think that could have helped you, made it better or not? Hmm, good question. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. You know, honestly, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the person would look like that would have been in a, in a effective mentor for me. <laughs> um, hmm. I'm sure, I, I think obviously mentors are important and I was involved in what is now Women's Leaders. Are you, you're involved mm -hmm. in that from the very beginning. It was not called Women's Leaders back then. But, um, you know, there's a lot of women that started out that did have strong mentors and it helped them uh, tremendously, but um, you know, I don't know if it would have made a, a difference if I had had this one person that I could go to and seek advice and help and whatever. Because you know, everybody has to find their own way with their own personality, and there's not one shoe that fits all. And so, for me to have an effective mentor, it would have had to be somebody that I could connect with. Um, that had a personality more similar to me um, because, you know, I'm not the touchy-feely kind of person that some people are and that's the kind of mentor they want and uh, I'm, just, I'm just not that person. So it would have to have been the right kind of person. Um, but I think, again, it's a very individual thing. I really think it just about anything. People have to, you have support. You have people that support you. You might have a mentor, but you've, you've really got to find your own way. I really believe that. You have to somehow find the strength, whether it's through relationships with uh, your teammates, whether it's relationships with your professors or your coaches or whoever it is. You've got to find the strength and the intestinal fortitude and the self-confidence to find your way. And uh, only you can find it. Nobody can find it for you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I have, I have a quick question. 
could you share what your experience was like being a high-level administrator and a mom? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, I have a very supportive husband, so that's helpful. Uh, he did a lot of cooking back in those days. Uh, was very close to our daughters. Um, so yeah, and actually when I, uh, I was honored, uh, what was then um, National Association of, Girl, of Collegiate Women Athletic Administrators and for Lifetime Achievement, and I said in those, uh, you need a support system. You know, for me it was a, my husband, but I had other support too, whether it's a partner or a spouse or friend or friends, you need support, wherever that comes from. And um, I, I don't think you can be a happy, you can't be happy in this profession or probably just about any profession if you don't have that kind of support system. And it, they all look different, whatever that support system is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right behind you. You um, grew up in a small town of Napoleon, and you went to Los Angeles, which is a large city, a large school. Can you comment on your experiences as far as, you mentioned about the culture difference, but as a teacher, a woman teacher in um, physical education, did you find a difference between Midwest as Ohio versus uh, California being more liberal? Did your students, uh, because you were a woman, young, did you get more slack of, compared to maybe a, a person who was uh, the male gender uh, about discipline? Did you have a hard uh, issue with that? Did you have, um, in the school system, um, did you have the support from the parents and say after the school was over with, 4.30 in the afternoon, did you have to be more protected uh, leaving the school system? Was it a lockdown school? No. <laughs> Not, not back in those days. That was, um, thank God, long before these kind of situations occurred. Um, you know, a lot of my students came from single family homes. Um, there was not a lot of involvement between uh, myself and, my, and the parents. Um, I did take quite a few of my students under my wing. In fact, uh, three of them came up in, in the summertime my husband, uh, we both taught school, and then he worked for the Forest Service up in Idaho, which he had done in college. And three of my students came up and spent a summer with us um, that needed that kind of experience and break. Um, I was probably, yeah, I got very close to some of those students just because of the background, and, and I think you know, looking back on it, the role model that I presented for them um, because I cared about them. And uh, no, I, wa I wasn't, uh, we didn't have to discipline. We didn't have to be hard disciplined Aryans. You know, I taught physical education, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we played volleyball and basketball and danced and did all those kinds of things. And um, yeah, but it was, it was altogether a positive experience, and uh, yeah. I actually have a question. Um, so looking at like the culture aspect of you know how you change things and you know the like progression of women's sports, um, we look at how the world's changing culture-wise and how things are becoming better now. Uh, as a student and as an athlete, what are some things like I can do and other people to grow that aspect of it? Well, I think, you know, the one thing is to, number one, care, and number two, be vigilant, because um, as, as this thing evolves, obviously there's going to be in, an impact on student athletes in a variety of ways not just women student athletes, but also mm -hmm. men student athletes, and the, especially the male student athletes in the non-revenue sports. Um, I always got a kick out of that, the revenue sports and the non-revenue sports. You know, uh, just because a sport generates revenue doesn't mean it generates a profit. 
Uh, and there's a lot of revenue sports that don't generate a profit. They generate revenue, yes. It is. That's a different subject. But I think, uh, <laughs> I think um, young people, and particularly student athletes going forward, and whatever your careers are, you just need to be vigilant, you need to be aware, and you need to care about what the future is going to hold. Because you all have, you're the ones that are going to have a voice in it. You're the mm -hmm. ones that are going to help shape whatever it is that's coming down the pike. And you need to be firm in what you believe in and what you're going to uh, fight for. And I would just piggyback onto that is there's a lot of people that are speaking for you all as student athletes. Mm -hmm. And it's a small group that's speaking for lots of student athletes and the experience oh. that you're having. And so um, I would just say find your voice and think about what's important to you and your experience for any student athlete because right now the squeaky wheel is getting the grease. Um, but that may not be the experience that all of our student athletes want across this country. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, we've got one. Hi, Ms. Marcia. My name is Emma. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your experiences in sport. I've definitely learned a lot, and I'm sure I can speak for a lot of us in the room, so thank you for your time. Your comments about uh, sport in the U.S. has become too important for too many people for the wrong reasons, not the right reasons. That resonates a lot with me. I'm, I'm from Northern Ireland, and so when I came here, I definitely felt that kind of privileging of sport and the value that U.S. citizens put on it and as well as certain people in sports and certain sports themselves um, but then you kind of you flip the script and you were like well maybe we're missing what sport does for its participants um, and that includes you um, you know as a trailblazer in, in for women working in sports so I'm wondering what has sport done for or to you or what are some kind of key takeaways that you have to share with us well <coughs> as I said before it's it was always my passion. I, I don't know why. I can't explain that. I can't tell you why. It just was. And so um, if I had had the kind of experiences student athletes today have, I'm sure I would have a different perspective on it um, as far as you know the teammates and what you go through. I mean, we had a very short basketball season, <laughs> and uh, we didn't. Uh, share a weight room we didn't share you know athletic training facilities or any of those kinds of things so I would hope that our student athletes today are um, well in looking at our 1991 basketball team that came back to be honored they share bonds today 30 years later and keep in touch a large group of them keep in touch with each other so as far as I'm concerned um, it gave me an opportunity to have a career in an area that I had a passion for. So it kind of transitioned from being a PE teacher um, to being an athletic administrator, and that was kind of like serendipity, <laughs> really. It's not like I grew up wanting to be an athletic director or anything like that. Um, so I think the opportunities and the paths that young people choose today, women in sport, um, are very much different. I mean, I've always wondered if I were growing up today, would I have become what I became? And the answer is maybe I would have, but maybe not. Because today, if you're a woman interested in sport, um, you could be in sports media. You could be in athletic development. You can be an athletic trainer. You know, you can be a strength coach, and there still aren't very many women in strength and conditioning. Um, there's an area that we really need more women to become involved in. Um, so there are a lot of... Why does that happen? 
<laughs> Is it you? <laughs> I'll take accountability. It's me. So anyway, there's a lot of, if you're a woman interested in sport, there's a lot of avenues you can pursue mm -hmm. today that really weren't available when I was coming through. So um, I'm not sure that answers your question, but it gave me the opportunity to be involved in a profession that, that I love because I loved working with students. I mean, here's a big difference. Back in the day, all the coaches started out as PE teachers, men and women. The coaches at Washington State University, some of them who are in Hall of Fames themselves, they all started as PE teachers. So we were all trained as educators. We were all educators first. Now, if you look at most coaches, they coach the way they were coached. They got into coaching after their student athlete experience and their old coach gave them a position as an intern or a graduate assistant or something like that. And they went on and they coached the way they were coached, but they were not trained as educators. And I think there's a huge difference in that and how it might have played out through the years into what we see now, we can only speculate about, but there's, um, I think that's a difference in when you were trained as an educator and then you became a coach and then maybe an administrator, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I was an athlete and then I was an intern coach and then I was assistant coach and then I became a head coach. And so, whatever. Anyway. Sorry, do I have to wait for the microphone? Oh, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, like this is to both of you. As athletic directors, do you think, what do you think the hiring criteria for head coaches should be? You just added like they were coached, became a graduate assistant. Is there any, I guess, classroom work that needs to be done for a degree requirements for a football coach, basketball coach, any athletic coaches like that? Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think uh, that ship has sailed is what I would say. Yeah. That yeah. ship has sailed. I think um, is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, you could go back in time and say, yeah, this, that, or the other thing. And, uh, right now, I think an important thing that's happened is there uh, opportunities for coaches of youth sports um, for some standards to be set mm -hmm. and sort of expectations, and I think that's incredibly important. But at our level, that ship has sailed. Yeah. But also, I think you see um, some of the most successful coaches that I've worked with, um, they are committed to teaching. They are committed to, you can, they're not going to come in and take over a great team and just be successful that way. They come in and they develop student athletes. And if student athletes come in, when they leave, if they're better than they were when they came in, right? And there's all different ways to get there. I think that's, that's kind of the key. There's definitely not a degree, I would say, because I've actually worked with coaches that had a degree in coaching, per se. They weren't good coaches. But I think that had to do with more of them as people, right? So a lot of it is character. A lot of it is being able to develop. A lot of it is can they communicate? It's all of those things. Can they show empathy? Can they show compassion? That's where you're seeing a lot of your more successful coaches now. Well, and I think probably BG and Washington State look for the same kinds of people. Mm -hmm. I've always said um, at Washington State, our coaches have to be better coaches because we're not going to be able to attract tons of blue star, five star athletes. So they have to be better at spotting potential. They have to be better at developing that potential. And if they are, then we're gonna be really successful in that sport. We've been successful in quite a, all of our sports at one point or another. Not as consistently maybe as Ohio State, but at one time or another. So yeah. yeah. Well, one, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this conversation. Um, two, I want to thank 
Marsha, for being here, and it has been a great honor to have this conversation with you. So if we can give our guests a round of applause. Well, it's been, a, it's been a huge honor to be here, to be back at Bowling Green and see some friendly faces and uh, meet with all of you. Thank you for being here. And um, I wish you all the best of luck uh, for you students in your careers in athletics as you pursue them, uh, whatever area you choose to be. I hope you don't all want to be ADs. I hope some of you want to be ADs, but we need lots of great people supporting the whole enterprise. Mm -hmm. And there's room for fantastic people in every single area, and that's what we all hope to hire, are fantastic people in every area, whether it's the first year sports information person or the sports information director or media services or whatever we're calling. Strategic communications. Strategic communications these days, okay. But um, yeah, and uh, you know, you, to, to make a huge impact, you don't all have to be athletic directors, I will say that. In fact, maybe you'll have more impact um, at another level. Mm -hmm. I mean, our athletic trainers, for example, how many of you in here are student athletes? Mm -hmm. Oh, quite a few of you. Mm -hmm. So you probably know, I mean, our, our athletic trainers or our strength coaches, they have uh, academic counselors, they're the ones that have the really close relationships with our student athletes and the ones that are probably going to have uh, on a, um, what's the word I want? Mac Micro, macro, micro, micro, micro impact on our student athletes, where we just have the impact at the macro level, yeah. Um, yeah. which is important because the macro level dr drives the micro level. But it's the micro level that really gets to know our individual student athletes and build those mm -hmm. kind of relationships, and it can have a, just a tremendous uh, impact on their lives. Mm -hmm. So those people are really important. Yep. Well, thank you all. Thank I you appreciate all. it. It was fun.